Welcome to Amazing Monday, the second episode. Today we're going to be covering Duel to the Death with the Vulture, the second issue of The Amazing Spider-Man, released on May 10th, 1963. The script, written by the only Stan Lee, with the art by Steve Ditko. In this issue, we open on the Vulture. We see him flying overhead and people are just mesmerized by him. You would think a city that has Spider-Man in it wouldn't be so mesmerized by just someone else flying. The very first thing we see the Vulture do is swoop down and steal a man's briefcase. Good job creating a flying suit to do that Vulture. You could have just walked up to him and done that. So switch over and Peter Parker's thinking of a way he can make money. He sees in the newspaper that J. Jonah Jameson wants exclusive photos of the Vulture and Peter thinks to himself, who can get better pictures of the Vulture than Spider-Man who also soars through the skies? So he goes home and asks Aunt May for a camera. Lo and behold, she gives him his Uncle Ben's. So flip back over to the Vulture and he's rifling through a newspaper trying to see his next big score. And what does he see? They're going to be transporting a million dollars worth of diamonds so he decides he's gonna steal them. He decides to throw rocks through the news station's windows and the police stations. What an old school way of doing things. He attaches pieces of paper to the rocks with little messages on them that you'll be able to see in this photo. If you hear fireworks outside, we're one day away from Independence Day, so there's nothing I can do about it, sorry. Now we see Spider-Man swinging through the rooftops trying to get that exclusive photo of the Vulture. He doesn't know, but the Vulture sees him. So the Vulture does this alley-oop and gets behind him and he comes crashing down and boom, hits Spider-Man on the back of the head and knocks him out. The Vulture thinks the best way to dispose of him is to throw him in this water tower. When Spider-Man hits the water, he immediately comes to. His first thought to get out is to climb up the side, but apparently it's too slimy or gooey as he describes and he can't stick to the wall. Plot convenience. Second idea, I'll use my web shooters to just pull myself out. Uh oh, web shooters out. There goes that warning detection system I was telling you about last episode, he really needs it. In all honesty, the Spider-Man is almost brought down by a water tower in his second issue. What he eventually decides to do is he swims to the very bottom, he coils himself up like a spring, and then he uses all of his spider strength to jettison himself out. That's how he eventually gets out of there. But to be quite honest, Spider-Man, you were almost just defeated by the vulture throwing you into a water tower. So we move on and Spider-Man goes, I need to update my outfit. Because if you remember, Spider-Man created this outfit for the circus to perform. There was no intention behind crime fighting in it. So he goes home and he creates some updated web shooters. And remember the belt I was telling you about last episode, the web shooter belt? He makes it in this comic and you'll see it in the photo here. He actually gets the belt. He wears it right under his shirt and it's right up against him so it doesn't become cumbersome when he's trying to perform all of his athletic feats. So we get Spider-Man back in his Peter Parker garb and we see him go up to J. Jonah Jameson for the very first time to sell him the exclusive photos. J. Jonah Jameson is so happy. We're never gonna see him like this again, so enjoy it. Also, is Whirlybird a popular slang term from the 1960s? Because Stan Lee will almost never call a helicopter by that name. He will almost always reference a helicopter as a worldly bird in every issue series he writes. In the Avengers, in the Uncanny X-Men, and even in Daredevil, whenever one of the heroes refers to a helicopter, they call it a worldly bird. So the cops, now informed that the Vulture is going to try and steal these diamonds, set up a perimeter. They set up a circle around the person who's walking with the diamond, and they've got shotguns pointed at the sky and pointed around them. They figure, no way is the vulture going to be able to steal these diamonds. So they're walking and right in front of them is a manhole cover. And all of a sudden the vulture becomes a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle and just pops up and steals them from below the sewers. Last thing you would expect, he takes them and he flies through the sewers, eventually exiting and swooping through the buildings knowing that the police are definitely not going to catch him. But we see Peter Parker quickly switching into his Spider-Man outfit and he catches up to the vulture, 
really quickly, the vultures see Spider-Man again following him and he does this alley-oop and he comes to dive bomb Spider-Man again. But for some reason, this time his spider sense works and he manages to avoid the blow. Why does Spider-Man's spider sense only work sometimes and not all the time? If it worked this time, it should have worked last time. The vulture did nothing different. So we see Spider-Man duking it out in the sky with the vulture. Spider-Man pulls out this device that he was building earlier in the comic and he presses a button. It causes the vulture to completely lose his ability to fly. You think earlier in the comics that the vulture just flies using his wings, but they're just to stabilize him. How he really flies is he harnesses magnetic power. I don't know how Peter Parker figured it out. Well, I know how he figured it out. He's a boy genius, but he, the things he talks about, it goes way over my head. So just check out the photo to see the little explanation that he gives. So we end the comic with the vulture being dazed on top of the rooftop, getting captured by police, and Spider-Man zipping away. Peter Parker goes to Now Magazine and turns in the photos to J. Jonah Jameson, who, like I said earlier, is in this weirdly happy mood and gives him a large sum of money for these photos. It's weird because in future comics, Peter will give him much better photos than these ones and get like hardly any money. But I guess Stanley hadn't really developed how hardened J. Jonah Jameson was going to be as a character, so he's kind of generous still. J. Jonah Jameson pays Peter Parker enough money to where Peter Parker goes and pays his Aunt May's rent for an entire year. The comic book ends on them being really happy, but trust me, this situation is not going to last. Although we didn't get a three-part issue this time around, we did still get a bonus story. Talk about Spider-Man being the favorite from the beginning. This issue is called The Uncanny Threat of the Terrible Tinkerer. We open up on this issue with Peter Parker getting bullied by his classmates for being the science nerd. However, being the science nerd, he gets offered to work with a famous electronics expert, Professor Cobwell. We see Peter Parker about to go out to meet Professor Cobwell, or Dr. Cobwell as he's calling him. and. He says that he needs to put on his costume underneath his clothes, just in case, and because he feels naked without them. So we see that he's starting to regularly wear the Spider-Man outfit underneath his street clothes. On the way to see Dr. Cobwell, Peter Parker needs to pick up a radio that's being repaired. One question, if Dr. Cobwell is this super famous electronics expert, why can't he just repair the radio himself? Why does he need to send it to some little rinky-dink shop to be repaired? So Peter picks up the radio, some conversation ensues between him and the tinkerer, and Peter leaves. We go underground and we see an alien working on different radios. Peter gets back to Dr. Cobwell's laboratory and he opens up the radio and he sees unusual gears inside of it. Cut back to the tinkerer's underground lair and we see the aliens discussing exactly what their plan is and we see that their plan is to spy on people. Cut back to Peter Parker and Dr. Cobwell tells him that he needs to leave for a few hours to attend a lecture that he's doing. Peter Parker goes, okay, he'll stay back and work on the radio. No, he doesn't. He immediately dons his Spider-Man costume and takes off back to the Tinkerer's lair because he knows something is fishy. When he gets there, he doesn't find anyone in the shop, so he goes downstairs where he sees the underground lair. Not expecting anyone, they have the door wide open. But he's caught looking at the aliens work on the radios and he fights with this other one. But he manages to get himself caught in this resisto glass enclosure. He's trapped. They're sucking the air out of the enclosure that he's trapped in. But he notices that in order to do this, they have to open up these little holes in the glass cage. So he uses precision webbing and he hits a little lever outside of the glass cage through the hole and it opens the cage. Another big fight happens and the building catches fire when Spider-Man knocks an alien who accidentally blasts one of his own computers. Spider-Man tries to save the Tinkerer but he can't and he gets himself out of the building while the other aliens escape can never return to Earth. That's a good way of saying, hey, I'm the monster of the week. 
And I was created specifically for this comic. You'll never see me again. So in some scenes, Steve Ditko draws Spider-Man in black instead of blue. But in this scene, he completely takes over all the blue spots and colors them in black. I really like the way it looks. How about you? So overall, this comic is pretty good. But at this point in time, it seems like they're just throwing villains at Spider-Man for the sake of having someone for him to fight. It's not going to be until a few more issues where we start getting more developed villains like the Green Goblin or Kraven the Hunter. Right now, we're just getting villains who are there for Spider-Man to duke it out with, but they're not very interesting. The Vulture is seen as that classic Spider-Man villain, but when you actually go back and read, for instance, this comic book, he's not very interesting. Thank you for watching this Amazing Monday's episode of The Amazing Spider-Man issue number two. If you like what you saw, don't forget to leave a like. And if you have any questions or comments or just want to let me know something, leave a comment below. Don't forget, we now have a Facebook page for our show. Go to facebook.com slash RFJ's comic book reviews. I'll leave a link below in the description so that you can easily find it. <laughs>